All our lives are stories. They tell us who we are. Come on, star. Hello, everyone. It's Cindy Valdez here, current president of A Tessel New South Wales, presenting on behalf of ACTA, the Australian Council of Tessel Associations. My presentation is all about embedding rich text and integrating visual arts in different subject areas. For over 20 years, my work with schools has been to support teachers and school leaders to increase their capacity to teach and challenge ELD learners, including students from refugee backgrounds. I have been able to witness how learners acquire the English language and engage in meaningful and purposeful learning experiences. But most of all, I have seen them develop confidence in all areas of their schooling. One way that learning can be supported is through visual art. So how can viewing and responding to art provide our ELD learners with opportunities to develop the skills of risk taking, problem solving, collaborating and critical thinking? My journey integrating the arts and visible thinking routines began in 2012 and continues today. Since 2014, I have been introducing students to the Art Gallery of New South Wales, a place where both knowledge and English language can be stimulated. My acknowledgement has been inspired by author of the colors we share, Angelica Das. Angelica is a Brazilian artist of African, European and Native American descent who lives in Spain. And I thought my Filipino, Spanish and Chinese background who lives in Sydney is a mouthful. I particularly love Angelica's acknowledgements and wish to share part of it here. In her words, to my ancestors for their guidance, my colorful family, educators and teachers around the world who choose to make a difference. And a few words from the book. Even though it seems like we're talking about color, we're really talking about how we see each other and what we believe about others based on their skin color. Sharing a couple more pages, you might be surprised to see that these four people who could all be labeled different races have the same color skin. Each person is unique if they share the same color. To know a person's story, you need to get to know them. I acknowledge that I am recording this webinar from the lands of the Darug Nation. I also acknowledge of the various lands on which you all work today and pay my respect to elders past and present and acknowledge that Australia always was, always is and always will be Aboriginal land. My journey with developing language through the arts began in 2012. I designed learning and teaching programs that integrated the arts to support English language development in our newly arrived learners, migrant background and including those from refugee background. The school I was at at the time had over 65% EALD learners and over 55% from refugee backgrounds. Through an action learning process, what I found was Creating and responding to artworks can help to develop the ability to describe and explain. Students can be invited to share their interpretations of what the image might be about. By sharing their wonderings or questions about an image, both language and literacy development are enhanced. There is growing evidence that arts-based programs support the well-being and cognitive development of students. Robin Ewing in 2010. In her review of the art in Australian education, Ewing argues that research demonstrates that students from every background would benefit from an arts-rich curriculum. Many researchers would argue that creating and interacting with art provides opportunities to explore symbolic meanings, since even when very young children create and interact with art, they are supported to use language to describe their experiences. This is important for all children, but as Rachel Burke and Rebecca Soraya Field in 2023 note in their research on the impact of arts on students from refugee backgrounds, here is a quote that I would give you a few seconds to read. In my classrooms, I have chosen to support students who are learning English while they're also learning content 
by using visible thinking routines. On the left hand side, you could see how we brainstormed what thinking means. Some of them came up with the thinking means pictures in my head, that they could ask questions and make meaning. Visible thinking routines can also support ELD students understanding of what it means to learn and think in a new context by making thinking visible, not just to themselves, but also to others. When newly arrived students interact with images from rich authentic text, including artworks, they are supported to learn how to infer, make interpretations and connections, as well as respond. A focus on meaning nurtures the kind of thinking that readers do. For instance, using the See Think Wonder routine helps to develop a learner's ability to observe images, artworks and artifacts closely. The careful selection of images is critical if students are to be able to make connections to personal experiences, activate prior knowledge, and interpret and make inferences about what they see. Quality text, including high modality images, offer more possibilities and information for students to explore than do simplified text. Furthermore, this routine helps students to develop vocabulary by learning everyday language and naming the participants and happenings in the images that they are viewing. So why the arts? I will give you a few seconds to read the quote from G in 2000. The arts can provide a rich and engaging learning experience for ELD students, allowing them to learn English in different contexts and through different modes of expression. Let's look at math in art, or is it art in maths, and how we may also integrate the use of rich text in teaching mathematical concepts. This is a rationale for the Mathematics K-10, I thought to include this here so you can see the implications for our ELD learners and the language demands to succeed in this particular subject. I like when it says, you know, it's a, it's a reasoning and creative activity, um, identify, describe and apply patterns and relationships, and the symbolic nature of mathematics provides a powerful, precise and concise means of communication. Here's another part of the rationale and more language demand um, to appreciate the elegance, to reason, apply mathematical understanding creatively and efficiently. I like that. I can already see and think of um, different ways that your students could respond um, to mathematical concepts and questions through art. Let's see where we can find math in art. We can find it in perspective, in geometry, golden ratio, proportions, fractals in art, just algorithmic, and there's also tessellations in art. And these are just a few examples of how mathematics and visual arts collide. I think by exploring the intersections between mathematics and visual arts, we can provide our learners a greater appreciation for both fields and their interconnectedness. So here we have an example of how I use an artwork to introduce the concept of position to stage one students. This artwork is called Paris Through the Window by the famous Marc Chagall. And Marc Chagall also happens to be of refugee background who came from Russia and moved to Paris in France. And it was a great artwork to introduce the topic because we were looking at um, obviously the Eiffel Tower, some, some landmarks, um, buildings, and um, they were able to name some of the objects and things on the artwork gave some interpretations that what it might be, what it may mean, um, which was wonderful. And so you can see that they're learning vocabulary, everyday language through just looking at this artwork and we were creating noun groups to name them. So we said a colorful window, um, a cat looking out, you know, um, a tall Eiffel Tower, 
we have a man flying down from the sky. So we were co using complete noun groups and also adverbials at the same time when labeling and talking about the image, which is fantastic. And it sort of launched into them talking about um, what, what buildings can you see in Fairfield at the time? What are some of the landmarks? Where are they? Where is the school in position, you know, in, in terms of where we are? That sort of um, at oral stage, we were already talking and using some of the academic words that are expected of them to produce and say in their own work. So this slide just shows you the outcome from stage one. I'll give you a moment to read that. I've highlighted the language demand for our ELD learners that we focused on as a class. And I like to describe the positions of objects in familiar locations. So this particular page was taken from a book called A Lion in Paris. And we did this, a see, think, wonder, this particular page to, again, build the field for our learners, activate any prior knowledge they might have, and did a see, think, wonder on this page. And kids were noticing, um, you know, words and dots and lines. And so a lot of them did say, I think it's a map. And I think it's the... Someone said, I think it's a drawing of um, someone's place, which is nice. And the other routine that we added was is called, what makes you say that? So for every um, reason or anything that they tell you, you just have to ask the question, what makes you say that? To extend that talk for them um, and gives them that opportunity to um, explain. The next page I'm about to show you is also from the book. And because we tell our learners that um, when you are making predictions, because we, we are as well, and we are making um, inferences, we have to use some clues. Um, and some of the clues are right on the images that we see. So this, again, a page from the book, um, A Lion in Paris, and students were invited to add onto their predictions of what the story might be about, um, which was great, and again, um, they gave us lots of, um, I think there were a couple of kids who recognized the Eiffel Tower and there were a few that, um, you know, the word Eiffel Tower on the first image was in French. However, a couple of them could make out that, oh, I think that that is what that says. So it's a nice um, way to get students to compare images as well, compare and contrast, which is a great metacognitive skill in its own. Um, so, yeah. And the other unit of work that we then looked at is around shape. So we call these 2D or not 3D and looked at two artists, um, Alexander Calder and Paul Clay, who were also huge fans of maps in their artworks. Let's have a look. And this was the outcome that the class was looking at, stage one. And again, have a look at the language demands that they recognize, describe, represent shapes, including quadrilaterals and other common polygons. Here's an artwork by artist Paul Clay. Um, he was a Swiss German artist who used maps concepts like geometric shapes and patterns in his paintings. And he also had a theory about colors and how they work together that was based on map concepts like harmony and contrast. So again, a great example of how you could integrate maps and art. Calder is another great artist to look at if you are looking at three-dimensional objects. Uh, he's very famous for making sculptures called mobiles that move with the air. To make these sculptures, he used math concepts like balance, proportion, and symmetry. And he also would have had to use math formulas, right, to figure out where to place each element of the sculpture so that it would be balanced and harmonious. The concept of displacement in mathematics could be looked at with your older students as well. And here I just gave some example uh, of how you could use poetry 
which will look into it to, again, launch this um, uh, idea to activate the prior knowledge of your learners and also build the field. So if we are to look at displacement and we agreed that the definition we're going to use is that um, is the distance and direction between two points in space. I found a great poem um, by Filipino writer um, A. Rodriguez from her book called Displaced. And there's a five part um, poem on displacement in the book. And here is her definition of what displacement is to put that there for you to have a look at. And what you could do then, um, in the following slide, I will show you how you could link the literacy part and the mathematics and the art in the next activity. So let's look at an example here of an activity you could do. So you could photocopy the pages of the text that you may have used to activate the prior knowledge of your students on the particular topic. So this is on displacement. So what I did was photocopied um, the pages and we did this recently with teachers. And what we then asked them to do is to circle words from that poem. So you can call this a poetry art. And from that poem, you could ask them to circle words that resonate with them, okay? and then with that they could draw on the page they could collage it they can do whatever they want and here are some examples um, that i've got for you um, and then you could get them to talk in pairs with a partner and talk about why these words resonate with them again a great way to um, embed vocabulary into that um, activity and you could make a list of words on on your black on the whiteboard or in the room and have that dis, uh, uh, displayed so then kids could refer to it and go back to it and could possibly use them in their own writing which is always great to see and these are just some examples of how you could show your learners how to turn you know your 2d flat paper and uh, shapes of squares and circles into three-dimensional objects such as the paper sculpture here that you can see and with Calder's work you can see how you could again again apply these concepts into creating their own mobiles. These two photos were taken from my new arrivals program. The child on your left with a dinosaur uh, sculpting a three-dimensional dinosaur using play-doh um, was just showing us what his favorite animal is because we were looking at animals and different types of animals and what they like so they have to actually make it and you know on next to him was a child who chose to draw the butterfly and basically copy that from an iPad so they were it was an open program where they can choose how to represent um, what their favorite animal is on your right we have Loika a great example of um, he had to recreate a scene from his weekend and he chose the medium of using play-doh in this instance and to show us um, how his family visited a temple on the weekend he will then write about this um, he will label the pic draw the pic what he created label it um, describe it for us and also then he could then write a recount of the event so as you can see, I like to do a drawing first, always draw first or create or bake it first before the students can write about it. I thought to share some of my own findings having embedded the arts into my teaching and learning programs in developing English language, but also the overall well-being of my learners. Um, what I found was that the kids were for the most part, very much substantively engaged. And they were all in it, you know, cognitively, um, operatively, they're making it, and also effectively, because they really cared about the work that they were doing. Um, as a result of that, there, were, there was very minimal um, disruptions in class, minimal um, challenging behaviors, because I found that they were really engaged in what they were doing. Um, 
also there were lots of opportunities for learners to um, make connections between the literacy, uh, you know, the literature, the books that you're reading to their own experiences, to what is happening in the world. Um, so in the program, we weren't only looking at art, we were also looking at metacognitive skills and making connections is a huge part of that. Um, when you talk about intertextuality, uh, great. You know, some of my kids could identify, could name an artwork that we looked at if they happen to be reading a book, for example, by Anthony Brown. Anthony Brown is amazing at um, bringing in artworks into his work. Um, so kids can see that and it's great for them to be able to uh, engage and be part of that conversation in the classroom and that they are included in the room. Um, absolutely improved learning outcomes in both literacy and numeracy, um, uh, in, in, even in their use of vocabulary, in their ways of articulating and reasoning. You can hear the vocab that they've learned in these lessons from the lessons. And also the ability to not just now answer questions, but also to ask questions. They could, they've learned through the, the visible thinking routines, how to ask deep questions, you know, the thick questions that we say. Um, and, and that's really important for them because you need to give them, give them a voice to be able to ask the questions. And then you have to give them, to give them the tools well, how do you do it? What question should I be asking? And I think last but not least, um, least uh, the arts had most certainly given my learners the gift of confidence. Because as we know, the arts um, really evens at the, the playing field for all learners. There is no right or wrong answer interpretations um, that you've actually given them the tools to, to take risk, to persevere, to uh, an opportunity to fail and do things again that is okay um, and yeah and then they're also learning the English language along the way so it's it's a win for all um, and I think to close I'd like to add that um, the work of Jenny Hammond around and Gibbons, Pauline Gibbons around high challenge high support and I think for myself um, I'd like to end with this that learning to communicate effectively in English is vitally important for all students and it's best facilitated by creating an inclusive, um, engaging learning environment that provides both maximum challenge and a very high level of support. And you can do all of this through the arts. Thank you. And our story is just a moment. All our lives are stories they tell us who we are But me, my friends, my family Those we love and love no more Live our lives as stories Not always knowing why But the world keeps turning round again Lives and stories just go by